Hi and welcome to a video on the life of a very inspiring person in the history of mankind, I want you to meet Helen Keller. She is famous around the world as a symbol of courage in the face of overwhelming odds, so, without further ado, let's get started. Helen Adams Keller was born a healthy child in Tuscumbia, Alabama, on June 27, 1880. Her parents were Kate Adams Keller and Colonel Arthur Keller, she had four siblings, two full siblings, Mildred Campbell, Keller, Tyson and Philip Brooks Keller, and two older half-brothers from her father's first marriage, James MacDonald Keller and William Simpson Keller. At 19 months old, Keller contracted an unknown illness described by doctors as an acute congestion of the stomach and the brain. Contemporary doctors believe it might have been meningitis, caused by the bacterium Neisseria meningitidis, meningococcus, or possibly Haemophilus influenza. This could have caused the same symptoms, but is a less likely cause due to its 97% juvenile mortality rate at that time, the illness left Keller both deaf and blind. In 1886, Keller's mother, Inspired by an account in Charles Dickens' American Notes of the successful education of Laura Bridgman, a deaf and blind woman, dispatched the young Keller and her father to consult physician J. Julian Chisholm, an eye, ear, nose, and throat specialist. Chisholm referred the Kellers to Alexander Graham Bell, who was working with deaf children at the time. Bell advised them to contact the Perkins Institute for the Blind, the school where Bridgman had been educated. When did Helen Keller meet, and Sullivan, as she so often remarked as an adult, her life changed on March 3, 1887, on that day, and Mansfield Sullivan came to Tuscumbia to be her teacher. Michael Anagnos, the director of Perkins School for the Blind, asked and Sullivan, a 20-year-old alumna of the school who was visually impaired, to become Keller's instructor. It was the beginning of a nearly 50-year-long relationship. Sullivan developed as Keller's instructor and later her companion. And began her task of teaching Helen by manually signing into the child's hand. And had brought a doll that the children at Perkins had made for her to take to Helen. By spelling do l l into the child's hand, she hoped to teach her to connect objects with letters. Helen quickly learned to form the letters correctly and in the correct order, but did not know she was spelling a word or even that words existed. In the days that followed, she learned to spell a great many more words. And, believed that the key to reaching Helen was to teach her obedience and love. She saw the need to discipline, but not crush, the spirit of her young charge. Helen quickly proceeded to master the alphabet, both manual and in raised print for blind readers, and gained facility in reading and writing. In Helen's handwriting, many round letters look square, but you can easily read everything. In 1890, when she was just ten, she expressed a desire to learn to speak, and took Helen to see Sarah Fuller at the Horace Mann School for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing in Boston. Fuller gave Helen eleven lessons, after which and taught Helen, throughout her life, however, Helen remained dissatisfied with her spoken voice, which was hard to understand. Helen's extraordinary abilities and her teacher's unique skills were noticed by Alexander Graham Bell and Mark Twain, two giants of American culture. Twain, had introduced her to standard oil magnate Henry Huddleston Rogers, who, with his wife Abby, paid for her education, Twain declared, the two most interesting characters of the 19th century are Napoleon and Helen Keller. From a very young age, Helen was determined to go to college. In 1898, she entered the Cambridge School for Young Ladies to prepare for Radcliffe College. She entered Radcliffe in the fall of 1900 and received a Bachelor of Arts degree cum laude in 1904, the first deaf-blind person to do so. The achievement was as much Anne's as it was Helen's. Helen was good at writing too. She wrote a total of twelve published books and several articles, one of her earliest pieces of writing, at age eleven, was The Frost King, 
1891. At age 22, Keller published her autobiography, The Story of My Life, 1903, with help from Sullivan and Sullivan's husband, John Macy. It recounts the story of her life up to age 21 and was written during her time in college. From an early age, she championed the rights of the underdog and used her skills as a writer to speak truth to power. A pacifist, she protested U.S. involvement in World War I. A committed socialist, she took up the cause of workers' rights. She was also a tireless advocate for women's suffrage and an early member of the American Civil Liberties Union. Helen's optimism and courage were keenly felt at a personal level on many occasions, but perhaps never more so than during her visits to veterans' hospitals for soldiers returning from duty during World War II, her message of faith and strength through adversity resonated with those returning from war injured and maimed. Her ability to empathize with the individual in need as well as with world leaders to shape global policy on vision loss made her a supremely effective ambassador. Helen Keller died on June 1, 1968, at Arkin Ridge, a few weeks short of her 88th birthday. Her ashes were placed next to her companions, and Sullivan Macy and Polly Thompson, Senator Lister Hill of Alabama gave a eulogy during the public memorial service. He said, she will live on, one of the few, the immortal names not born to die. Her spirit will endure as long as man can read and stories can be told of the woman who showed the world there are no boundaries to courage and faith. Let me leave you with one of Helen Keller's famous quotations, the best and most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They must be felt with the heart. Let me acknowledge the sources for these pieces of information. Wikipedia, an American foundation for the blind, do not forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, God bless us.